Today is July the 13th, 2017. My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University. And today I am in Seminole, Oklahoma, on the land of the Seminole Nation. Makasuke Mission. Makasuke Mission. There you go. And I am speaking with Shane Phillips, the Wildlife and Parks Director. And this is part of our Spotlight in Oklahoma uh, project with a focus on the monarchs. So thank you for letting me come today. Thank you. Let's start with learning a little bit about you. When and where were you born? Okay. I, I'm from Holdenville, but I was born in Shawnee. And uh, my birthday is June 28, 1978. 1978, so, okay. And so you were born in Holden, you're, no. From Holdenville. You live in Holdenville. So. How far is that from here? Uh, about 20 minutes, well, 20, not, 30 minutes, yeah. That's not bad. No. Brothers and sisters? I have a uh, younger sister and a young brother. So you're the eldest and yep. in charge, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My little brother was 12 years younger, so. so it was a little different. Okay, and what did your parents do for a living? Uh, my, my grandpa, um, he had bought a funeral home when my dad was younger, and uh, so they moved to Holdenville and um, started a funeral home there. He bought two other funeral homes, Wewoka and uh, Ada, and so my dad pretty much grew up in the funeral business. Um, my grandpa um, lived in Sarah, was a cotton farmer, and my dad always loved farming, so he pretty much did both. Um, he, you know, worked at the funeral home as a funeral director and and farmed peanuts and stuff when I was growing up. So, uh, my mom, uh, she worked as a secretary at the funeral home and um, went back to school, and now she's a teacher, in fourth grade. So. And were they born and raised in Oklahoma? Uh, yes, both of them were born in Oklahoma. My mom was from Prague and my dad was from Lawton first, or Edmond, and then um, moved to Holdenville. So. And had their, parent, um, had their parents also been born in Oklahoma or mm -hmm. had they come from? My, my grandpa was from Sayre. Uh, my grandma was from uh, Noble. My mom's dad was from the Shawnee Meeker area, and my grandma was from Chandler. So a lot of long time roots in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Okay, she's always trying to nice to see which if they came from the land run or how they yeah, initially got to be. Yeah, I think before be then, Oklahoma. either one I'm not sure was from Arkansas, and so they moved from Arkansas to here. Okay, but I'm not sure which one. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Do you want to name the name of the funeral home? Uh, yeah. Um, my grandpa uh, bought Hudson, and uh, I don't know, sometime when I was in high school, changed it to Hudson Phillips. Uh, he also bought Stout and we woke a, and it's Hudson, or Stout Phillips, I think, and then he bought Smith Fender Home in Ada. So, my uncle, my grandpa's passed away now, my uncle owns and operates all of them. So. Okay. So, the long history there, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, my dad pretty much was raised in the funeral business and was looking for a way out of this. <laughs> but he raised peanuts, too. Yeah, said. he raised peanuts. So. Well, did you have to help on the farm or in yeah, the funeral home? I yeah, know. I did, both both places. Um, when we were growing up, a lot of times, you know, after school we would be at the funeral home upstairs. It was a two-story uh, funeral home, and we would stay upstairs. Uh, during the summer, I was always, you know, on the farm with my dad, and when we were raising peanuts, we were there, you know, when the sun come up, hoeing peanuts. <laughs> so, so it was one of those things. <clears throat> my dad uh, was a really hard worker. His dad raised him to be a hard worker. I mean, he pretty much learned to drive that, learned... Uh, to drive, driving an ambulance. I mean, at the time they had the ambulance and, you know, picking up, you know, people from the hearse. It was the same thing back then. So, so he, he was, uh, you know, born into it, I guess. I guess you would say, because he was pretty young when they moved there. So, and uh, during high school, I worked at the funeral home all the way through through my first or my second year in college, I'd drive back and forth working at the funeral home. So, and decided that wasn't for you either. 
<laughs> no, <laughs> not ever. <laughs> not the family business. Now my grandpa would set us on his lap and be like my my two funeral directors, <laughs> but neither me or my cousin went to the funeral home. So well, it takes a special person to do it. To, really to does. Do that. It really does. And to raise peanuts takes and, it takes yeah. takes. So during, like in a normal school day, like when you were in high school, would you have to go do something like that before you went to school? No. Or work on the farm or anything? No, just, uh, no, when we were in school, well, when I actually got to high school, my dad had went back to mortuary school in, in uh, Dallas and actually got his, you know, funeral director's license. And so he was mainly at the funeral home then. And so... Uh, of course, I was in basketball, and so after you know basketball practice, I'd go into work, and I usually um, did the nighttime service if there was you know I came in till five, but if there you know if there's a family coming in, then I stayed till eight or nine or whatever. And that was you know clean cars, clean the funeral home, do that kind of thing. Mm. Kind of quiet too, I guess. Yeah. Oh. I always wore a suit, <laughs> which I think that's one of the parts me and my dad hated the most. <laughs> well, let's back up and start with your education. Where did you go to elementary school? I went to school at, um, it wasn't Ethel Reed then, but it was Parkview, and then they renamed um, Parkview Ethel Reed after um, T. Boone Pickens. It was either his mother or his sister. I can't remember, but the, the library is also named that too, so. After his mother, I think. The, mother, the okay. library's mother. Okay. Um, I went to Thomas Middle School, and then I went to Oldenville High School. And what year did you graduate? 97. 97. And what was your favorite subject? Um, not I don't know. Not I had basketball. A, no, but no. <laughs> I, I had a really good math teacher. I was always good at math and geometry. Miss Davidson, she was amazing. And um, I liked math. At, um, my senior year, I actually quit um, athletics or basketball and did art, and I love that because I'm pretty good at it. But I'd always been in FFA music and athletics, so I never could take art. But I took art my senior year, and I loved it too. I always liked science, and uh, that's basically what I went to. Uh, eventually went to school for. Well, you liked everything just about. Yeah. English, not no. so much. <laughs> <laughs> so besides basketball, did you do other sports? Uh, yeah, I ran cross country and um, played basketball, run cross country. Would have liked to have played football, uh, but I always thought that I was too small. I was really small in high school. I mean, I could bench my own weight, which was 75 pounds. <laughs> so I never did play basketball, but uh, mainly I, I was in track a little bit, but mainly cross country and basketball. FAA instead of 4-H? FFA. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we had 4-H when I was growing up, uh, but FFA in high school. Okay. And I served as treasurer and I don't remember. I was an officer in FFA. Showed pigs and okay. um, different stuff like that. Fun stuff. Yeah. yeah. So in high school, did you have any idea of what you might want to do for your uh, career? You know, I really didn't. I um, No, I really didn't. I mean, you know, I liked certain things. Uh, but uh, I didn't really. About how many is in your class? I graduated with close to 92, 93, yeah, not pretty quite good. 100. Pretty good size mm -hmm. for Oklahoma. Yeah. yeah. So from when you graduated from high school, what did you do? Um, I went to ECU for two years. Uh, I had I really didn't want to take a foreign language, but you know you had to take a a different language. So I took um, 
at ECU, you have a choice to say sign language, which they have a really good sign language um, program. And um, I actually thought that's you know, what I wanted to do. To, so I took sign one and sign two and then another, another class. So my first year I was undecided as a freshman. You know, I got a lot of um, those classes out of the way. My second year, though, I took um, sign one and sign two, and I loved it. And I thought, well, maybe I'll be a teacher and, you know, teach teach kids with uh, hearing, you know, deaf or what, however you want to say that. Mm -hmm. um, but then decided that's not what I wanted to do. <laughs> After sign two, I realized that... Um, Trying to learn that language and teach was not something that I could could do at the same time. <laughs> I went to um, there's actually a, a daycare in Wewoka, and I don't know if it's still there, but Heather Tucker uh, was the teacher at the time, and they had um, there's a lady in Wewoka that had a deaf child, and uh, she actually worked for my uncle at the funeral home. Uh, I can't recall her name right now, but anyway, so they they actually had a school there, and Heather Tucker had a degree in sign language and was teaching kids there, and so I actually went there a couple times to help with her. It's pretty awesome to see little kids, I mean, already signing, and, you know, one of them was before he would normally even be able to speak. He could sign and talk to you the way that a normal kid could, which was pretty awesome. But I decided that wasn't wasn't exactly <laughs> what I wanted to do. So, um, so then I went to OSU. Um, I had always liked being outside, not necessarily hunting, but we had always hunted quail and uh, we never hunted deer or anything but um, and I'd always liked ag agricultural so I went to OSU to get a degree in wildlife conservation. Um, loved it up there, I absolutely loved it. Uh, made some friends that you know I'm still still friends with. Um, went to school there for two years uh, OSU is really high on the agricultural stuff, so you had agricultural stuff on top of wildlife classes, and uh, couldn't seem to uh, make the grades <laughs> there. But I still wanted to do that degree. Um, so after two years at OSU, I went to Southeastern and uh, finished my degree at Southeastern. Um, got the degree. Uh, didn't necessarily use the degree yet, um, kind of using it here, uh, being the Wildlife Parks and Recreation Director, but <clears throat> not so much uh, as I would have thought, really. Um, so what years were you at OSU? At OSU, I was there from 99 to 2000. Okay. Um, less miles. <laughs> Enough so, yeah. Did you uh, did you live on campus? No, I didn't because I was a sophomore. I was able to um, to live off campus, which would have been nice because I had friends who lived on campus, and uh, it would have been it would have been a lot cooler. But <laughs> uh, but no, I lived off campus, and uh, that was okay too because it was a little quieter get you away from school if you wanted to be away from school and not. Lived in the dorms at ECU and that wasn't fun. So I, did. <laughs> I actually had a friend who, uh, it was, it was kind of weird because I was sitting at ECU, I wasn't, you know, really happy going to school there and had a, a friend from high school saying he just graduated from um, school at, at Roberts. But Wilberton, I'm not really sure what the school is there, and he said, I'm going up to 
OSU to school, I need a roommate, and it was kind of weird because we hadn't talked in a while. And I was like, well, you know, let's do it. So, <laughs> and it was one of the best choices I made because. Did you have a favorite professor while you were there? Uh, Dr. Hattie. I don't know if he's still there. He taught mm -hmm. soul science. Uh, Jeff Hattie, I loved him. He was awesome. I aced that class. <laughs> uh, I'd ac actually done, um, forgot about that. I'd, I was in soul science, or not soul science, but in um, land judging in FFA. That's mainly what I did. I forgot about that. Um, and had a teacher there, Gerald Roberts, who was just awesome. We actually, uh, when we were, I think, freshmen or sophomores, even before we were old enough to do it, um, he put us on the land judging team. And a year later, we went to Oklahoma City for nationals and placed fourth, oh. which was kind of crazy because the year before it was in Hawaii, so <laughs> and we went to Oklahoma City. <laughs> But we placed fourth, and that was pretty, nationwide, that was pretty awesome. So when I got to uh, OSU and had to take soul science anyways, I loved that class. And I actually uh, was going to uh, get on the soul science, or the land judging team there, and just didn't have enough time. So I'm not sure what that is, though, land judging. What land judging. Into, what does it entail? Basically, you you go out and and what they do is you test the soil, or you try the soil to see what degree of sand or clay is in the mixture, like sandy loam or um, different stuff like that. Like the NRCS, they do soil test, which is just you know for a farmer to know what kind of soil he has, he can determine what kind of crops and plants grow their best. So land judging was basically um, you go out and you score land, which um, I'm not, I can't really remember the uh, categories, all of them, but soil texture was one. And basically what they do is they go out there and they dig a big pit and you go down in the pit, you measure the top soil and um, basically grade the soil on different places. They would do it on different farmers' lands or whatever. And you would grade, grade the top soil by erosion. You would grade it by texture. Um, what's some of the other ones? Oh, slope. Uh, you know, if it's really slopey, it's not going to be graded as high as it is flat or whatever. And then the deeper the topsoil, the better. And um, the more topsoil, the better. And then dis different soils are better for different things. So um, it, was, it was fun. I loved it. My teacher was awesome. And uh, Jeff Hattie, I hope he's still there because he was an awesome teacher. Yeah, he, you know how... The classes in OSU were so big compared to, you know, 25 kids in my high school classes. And, uh, you know, I mean, he knew every kid that ever went through his class. He knew every single person in his class, which there's probably around 100 to 150 people in each of his classes. And he knew all of them. He'd call you by name to answer a question. I mean, it was, he was an awesome teacher. Had that personal touch. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, you know, I don't know, I can't remember if it was the class or just the land judging thing, but we went out to his house a couple of times for cookouts and stuff. He was just an awesome teacher. Mm -hmm. um, I also had a um, guy who did our freshman orientation that was just amazing, and I can't remember what his name is, but I wish you I loved it all around. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't. Typically, uh, my dad never watched football. I mean, they worked. On Saturday, they worked. On Sunday, they worked. They didn't watch football or anything. So I wasn't actually a per se Cowboys fan till till then. But I worked. I worked at Chuck's Paint and Paper, and they, you know, loved it. And um, I'd be cleaning the warehouse and listening to the game, no matter what it was, basketball, baseball, and 
didn't go to too many games while I was there because I was poor, but, <laughs> but I loved, I loved the football. So. Well, did you have a favorite spot on campus? <laughs> the library, really, and, mm -hmm. you know, the, and the, or the lawn. I just, I mean, it, I love that place. Uh, I wish I could have finished there. <laughs> yeah, maybe you go back someday. Maybe. Yeah. So once you got your degree from Southeastern, that's in Tahlequah, right? No. Durant. 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 Northeastern's in Tahlequah. Okay. Uh, then what did you do? Uh, I actually uh, went to work for Big Lots Distribution Center for two years. Uh, that was hard work. Didn't see a real future there. Um, Really the reason why is, uh, you know, I would taken the test for Game Ranger or Game Warden and uh, Biologist and, and really didn't score too high on those uh, things. And most of the time, you know, there's not really a, um, a job come up too often for those. And when there are, they take the, you know, they take the ones with the highest, highest score. So, and I wasn't really looking to carry a gun and be in law enforcement either. Uh, I like, I like to hunt, but I like to view uh, nature more than, than that. You know, I like to observe and, and um, I was in the, uh, oh, what was it called? It's like the biology club at OSU. And we different did different things, you know, just to help the environment and stuff like that. And so I wasn't really finding a, any jobs like that 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 I was called back for or anything like that. So I went to Big Lots, worked there for two years, um, and then uh, one of my friends um, had started a job at the uh, Chickasaw Children's Village, which I loved helping kids before. Uh, while I was in school at OSU, we went to a church in Perry, and we were big involved into the youth there. We were, you know, um, we had taken a couple of kids to, you know, church camp the years before and loved working with kids. And so he was like, hey, we have a job opening for house parents. And me and my wife had just been married for about two years and decided to be house parents at the Chickasaw Children's Village. So we went out there. Um, basically, that job was you raise, uh, we, were, we were in a house with girls. It's a cottage. Uh, one ends your end with your room. The middle uh, is um, basically the living area, the kitchen, the dining room, the living room, and then on the other end, the girls had their rooms. And most most of the time we had about eight girls living with us. Mm -hmm. And and that was hard being uh, newly married and uh, most of the time they're there either because of, uh, you would say disciplinary things. They, they weren't wanting to go to school. They weren't wanting to do their homework. A lot of times I seen though, it was more that the parents weren't really involved and they sent them there to be less involved. Mm -hmm. And so um, the kids that were at, at first were, you know, a little skeptical of us. Let's try the new people out and see if we can get them to leave in the first week, <laughs> you know. And, um, but that was a learning, a learning curve, really. Um, it, w it was amazing some of the stuff that that happened out there. We we got a lot of the kids to to go to the church with us. Um, actually, I forgot this too. Uh, while at OSU, I went to the MBSF, which is Missionary Baptist Student Fellowship, and it's a group of college kids who um, get together every week, you know, and we have Bible study, and then you know we do different stuff across the campus. And I I'm pretty sure that it's still there. Uh, we actually had a church that uh, from the church in Perry was planted in Stillwater. And I'm not really sure. I think it might be Liberty. 
uh, but um, anyway, so so when I went to Southeastern, uh, we started that same thing at Southeastern Missionary Baptist Student Fellowship, and um, so I was going to church there, and we got most of our girls to come to church, you know, Wednesday and uh, Sundays. And so, you know, uh, we've seen these girls grow. Um, you know, we had a lot go in and a lot come out. Uh, but, you know, it helped us grow too because, you know, it was like we didn't have any kids and <laughs> we were raising eight. <laughs> and so it was, it was pretty tough at the time. Uh, but, um, how long were you there? For two years. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, my wife uh, became pregnant. Uh, we um, harder to do. You know, we we stayed probably a couple of months. I think Abby was born in October, and uh, we left like in June, I think. So uh, it was just going to be too hard for us to stay. Uh, but you know, we still have girls. I still am friends with some of the girls on Facebook uh, that we still, you know, see occasionally. A lot of them were from the area. There's actually a few that were actually Seminole. And, um, and we still kind of stay up with them. You have a variety of things there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did you end up in this position? Uh, I moved back to Oldenville, um, got a job here. Uh, you know, at first it was like, you know, they, it was wildlife and parks, um, position, a director's position, and I really didn't know, you know, exactly what that meant, but I thought it was going to be wildlife stuff. Um, got to work here, found out that it was more, uh, recreation than anything, which was, you know, okay. Uh, they actually, at the time, they only had, uh, they didn't have too much land that wasn't uh, economic. You know, like they have uh, the complexes in Wewoka, and, um, you know, we have different businesses that they own property for, but the main property that they had was here, which is only 300 and something acres. So, uh, my first thing was, you know, I'm going to apply for every wildlife grant I can, <laughs> and, and it was kind of funny because even though I knew, you know, that 300 acres, you know, on top of all the, the head start and all the buildings and stuff that we had out here, so you couldn't, you know, put that into the grant, only the wooded kind of pasture acreage. So, so I started applying for grants out here and, you know, was laughed at a couple of times because, <laughs> like, I, I applied for a, um, a quail rehabilitation because I had been all over this land. And I, I'd say there's about 300, or there's 330 acres here. Uh, but with all the uh, buildings and stuff that are on the property, there's probably only around 100 and... 30 so that could be used for something when I buy. So I applied for a, um, a Bob White Quill rehabilitation and he's the first thing he said was how much land do you have? <laughs> and I told him and he laughed. <laughs> and so I was like yeah I know but you know you gotta start somewhere. Um, and we, did, we didn't get that grant. I, I finally ended up uh, getting a grant for um, it was chronic wasting disease in deer, which you don't have to have a, a land for. You just, you know, you take samples from uh, the deer check stations. And I actually went to a food, pro or not a food processing, but a, uh, a process, you know, where they process the deer meat. And um, got a lot of samples there and, and completed that, that grant. But, Basically, when I found out, I mean, I got here, I found out that it's more recreation. Um, I was over um, the softball complex, which there's three fields, 
a concession bathroom, everything like that. Um, I was over the gym, which which uh, is where my offices are now. Uh, we have a pond where tribal members can fish. Uh, while I was here, they you know they kind of had an area uh, for camping, but I developed the RV side of the campgrounds. Um, so RVs can come during our Seminole Nation days and park and get electricity and water and stuff like that. And then um, <clears throat> a couple of years ago, I, um, I went to a training. I started playing disc golf. I love disc golf. Uh, and uh, went to a training on designing disc golf courses. And, you know, I was a recreation director, so, oh, nice. so why not? Uh, I built an 18-hole course out at the mission. And um, right now on Disc Golf Course Review, it's ranked like fourth or fifth in the state. So pretty cool. <laughs> get used a lot. Yeah. Does it? Um, you know, we're not very close to the city. It's still like an hour or something from the city. But I get a lot of people from Ada, Shawnee, others around 10 or 12 guys here that come out regularly wow. and play. And we, we do tournaments. Our biggest tournament is Seminole Nation Days, which is coming up in September. And we usually have about 30. But it's um, it's kind of hard because we're so far away from the city. You know, in the city, they can go to the parks and see older people play. Here, you see them play in softball, basketball. A lot, a lot of the native people are into softball and basketball. And so, we we have um, tournaments at Seminole Nation Days for that, and and we just this year will be our fourth uh, Seminole Nation Days disc golf tournament. So we're hoping it's bigger, but usually it's a little less than thirty. So I didn't realize it was so popular across the state. Is you know it's it's crazy. Uh, they actually started around um, the sixties. Eddie Hedrick started, I think it was in California, but um, it, it's huge and it's it's big in Stillwater. There's at, at uh, McMurtry, there's two courses at McMurtry, and then there was one at that, uh, there's one at Boomer. Boomer Lake, yeah. Okay. And man, uh, the first time I seen it, I was in Norman going to school at ECU, and I went to play it again, and I, I had. You know, I never played football or baseball, hated baseball. Uh, but I'd always loved to throw frisbees around. And I played a little ultimate frisbee, but um, I seen disc golf stuff. It was like in 97 or something, and I wish I'd picked it up then because <laughs> I've only been playing for four years now, but I just love it. And, you know, there was courses in Stillwater then. I wish I'd have played that too. <laughs> so how long have you been in this position? Um, <clears throat> next month will be 10 years. Oh, quite a while. So, yeah, at my my job's actually changed. Um, we actually did buy more land two miles south of here. Uh, we bought 1,200 acres and um, I, I had a guy under me. Uh, they pretty much just since I'm BIA funded, they, they couldn't change the name, so Wildlife Parks and Recreation stick. And, and I kind of still help him too anyways. But uh, they pretty much split us up. He, he's doing my job now. And I'm over um, the 1,200 acres. Uh, you know, we're in the process of redoing the fences, trying to get a... Uh, we bought two different pieces of land and the the best access point is where the lady still lives so it's, it's kind of hard to transverse the the land so we're working on getting fences built and a road that way we don't have to go through her all the time and uh, and we, we have an equip program with the NRCS which is we clear clear so many acres of timber or whatever for pasture land and they reimburse us. <clears throat>
we actually have wetlands on the property and we have uh, pecans too, which is something that we, you know, in the future we're going to look into. Uh, but it's just me and 1,200 acres, so that's... Have those 1,200 originally been the, 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 the nations? No, no, we bought them from two different, two different people. Uh, Billy Self, which that's what I was saying, she still lives there. She still owns the homestead, uh, 40 acres right there at the, um, at the start of the property, which is one of the challenges. Um, but you can actually go two miles straight here and dead into there, which is where we're trying to set up the you know main gate. And if we ever do put a barn or whatever, we'll be there. Um, but it's just a little difficult to access. It's off like a 70, 100 foot drop. So we're <laughs> trying, to, trying to figure out how to work that in to, it's, it's, you know, you don't just go through the fence and there's where you set up. It's a little bit more difficult than that. But we also, um, I'm also in charge of uh, a monarch butterfly habitat grant. And um, I was <coughs> contacted by Jane Breckenridge, who owns Uchi Butterfly Farm in uh, Bixby. She had contacted me trying to get different tribes involved in, in this grant. Um, it's actually through uh, Kansas University and Monarch Watch, which is a, a program there at Lawrence uh, with Chip Taylor who is the, the main guy over it. Uh, but it was kind of crazy because, you know, I've, I'm a one-man show and I've got, you know, more work that I can deal with. And it, I had been talking to Jane a while and had almost, you know, given up on it because, you know, adding something to what I've already got is just all, almost impossible. And uh, Chief had said, yeah, well, we'll get you some help, you know, <laughs> one of those things. And so um, they had set up a meeting with Jane, and I didn't even know that she was coming, but Carol Crouch from NRCS and Jane Breckenridge came, and Chief was there, Assistant Chief. And uh, so we set up this meeting. Jane went through the program of what, you know, the grant would entail you know, what we needed to do, what they could do, and the uh, chief said yes. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, <laughs> you said you'd give me help. <laughs> um, but anyways, that, so I had actually just met with Jane then. I talked to her on the phone a couple times, but uh, Jane, Jane's amazing person. She uh, is one of the reasons why this grant is off the ground, and um, and a lot of the reasons why the tribes in Oklahoma are involved. Um, she, like Chip, is is amazing and they just go everywhere. I mean, like you said, it's hard to get hold of Chip. Um, so what do you have to do? What part part is Okay, so so the grant entails it's it's for two years. Um, basically I never planted anything in my life that grew and, <laughs> you know, uh, was able to raise, I'd say. So I'm not a green thumb or anything. But anyway, so the grant is for two years. Um, basically, we, uh, we monitor the, the butterflies that are coming in, which, which the reason for the grant is the decline in monarch butterflies. Um, and their habitat. And, uh, you know, the decline could be from weather or it could be from anything, but if they don't have a food source, then they don't have a food source. And so uh, tribes around the state that are on the grant, um, our job was to pick spots uh, for, for planting milkweed, which is the main source of uh, the monarch butterflies or caterpillars diet um, and 
get these places that the tribe agrees. Uh, let's see, we were supposed to, uh, I think it was around 50 acres that we were supposed to allocate just for milkweed. Like, no round, or, you know, try to have them secluded, but, but an area that wasn't being used that we could put into uh, production for milkweed and milkweed seed, or, yeah, you know, seeds. And so, so we, we picked a few places. Um, we actually have a place, 29 acres, uh, just on Highway 99, that we haven't used yet, but we're going to use in the future. And then um, I actually used some of my disc golf course as a spot to, to plant the milkweed. Um, some of the OB is higher grass, a lot of the area out here has been untouched, so there's a lot of native grasses, there's a lot of native flowers already. And so we picked these two places, went before council, they agreed, or, or they approved these areas. And so um, the first summer, uh, we planted 2,500 milkweed plants, wow. which uh, the, the grant is for uh, 5,000, so that's 200 and, or 1,200, 1,200 plants per year. Uh, we, we planted those plants in the OB area, which um, on disc golf course is out of bounds. And so basically untouched, I don't mow there. You know, we don't do anything there. We want plants to grow there so it doesn't all wash away because a lot of times when you start uh, mowing or disturbing an area and and these places were already kind of um, eroding so putting new plants and stuff like that in helps so we we planted these plants the first year um, basically that was our biggest thing we we uh, went to a training in Lawrence before you know about the grant and everything but our biggest thing uh, our biggest event starting off for the grant was the milkweed planting. And um, we planted 2,500 milkweed plants in one day. It took um, a while, did it? <laughs> yeah, I, I had a lot of help from, from other tribes. Um, and, you know, watering and stuff like that, we weren't sure. We, we had planted really late, and so we weren't sure that the milkweed had made it. You know, we, we watered a couple of times before. Uh, that was one of those years where there was no rain at all. And um, so we weren't sure that the milkweed had made it. So going fast forward into this year, uh, the milkweed did great in, in a lot of the areas. And um, so it's a really tough plant. Okay, going back, that fall uh, when all these wild flowers, wild, you know, plants uh, were starting to die off and uh, release their seed, another part of the grant was collecting seed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, you know, the first year you're kind of just getting to know everything and uh, you don't know a lot of plants anyway, so you got <laughs> you know, you have Jane and, and I had a lot of help from the Chickasaws. We, I actually went to some of their plantings and then I went to some of their seed identification deals too to learn, you know, different flowering plants. Should have learned more at OSU because <laughs> I had agronomy and, um, Oh, botany and stuff like that but you know you forget <laughs> anyway so so we're going out there and we're collecting seed and we're not really sure what kind of seed it is but you know uh, uh, we're getting seed and so putting it in baggies if we know what it is we write it on the baggies and everything like that so we collected seed got quite a bit of seed there was you know uh, there was some ironweed, wait, no, not ironweed, uh, thin mountain mint that we found out that nobody else had. Mm -hmm. And so we collected a ton of it. Uh, we collected a uh, clasping coneflower. Uh, we collected some sunflowers. We collected some goldenrod. Uh, we had some liatris, uh, two different kinds of liatris. 
Uh, what else did we collect out here? Um, some basket, basket plant. I can't remember what the names of all of them are. And then we went to all of, uh, some of the different tribes and helped them collect seed too. Then you had to clean the seed and get everything. I mean, it was you know one of those things that was hands on all the way. <laughs> so uh, we went to a training, learned how to clean the seed. That took forever. A, a lot of times during the the winter months, you know, you can't do a lot of stuff outside. So I was cleaning seed, and that took that took a long time, and it was tough. Uh, the thin mountain mint, which we did get a lot of, is I mean, it's super, super tiny, and super, super hard to clean, and so that spent, that took up a lot of time during the winter. The next part is planting, or actually putting the seed in cold, cold germination, putting it in the refrigerator. Since you picked the seed, you didn't uh, let it stay in the ground to overwinter, you had to put it in, uh, which it, it's called cold stratification. You had to put it in the uh, refrigerator to simulate winter. So basically, you know, winter's usually going to be a little longer than three months, but, you know, we're trying to speed up nature, I guess you would say. So we put it in for a month, maybe two months, I can't remember. Uh, but then get it out and plant it, germinate it. <coughs> you put it in germination trays. And at the time, we had a hoop house put up, which is to, to raise the plants in. And um, so we took the seed out of cold stratification, put it in germination trays, which basically you just um, put the substrate or whatever you're going to plant it in and just kind of put it in rolls so you'll know if you have different... Um, if you have, we had three different things in each germination tray. And so um, you let that grow out um, over a period of time. I actually had had mine die. <laughs> like I said, uh, try to plant plants at the house, and nothing nothing lives. But uh, I was I was really having good success, really having good success, and I'm um, doing it all by myself. So coming in the weekends, two times. A day during the weekends to, to water and uh, had some someone else water <laughs> one weekend and they didn't uh, and when they're small the germination trays have little clear little trays that uh, uh, that you put during the during, during the night so they hold in the heat mm -hmm. and you actually have a um, heating pad underneath that uh, heats them the, the tray that you set on top keeps the heat in, you know, and it, if it gets below a certain temperature or whatever, the heat heating pad kicks on, warms them up, keeps them warm. Then in the morning you take them off, you water them, leave it off all day, put it on at night. So uh, they forgot to do both of those, and I had everything die. So, you know, I'm a little nervous about calling Jane <laughs> telling her everything's dead. But I called Jane, you know, she was super cool about it. She said, just keep watering and we'll see what happens. So for two weeks I watered them. Um, and I, we actually have an aquaponics um, uh, greenhouse over here, which the food distribution, they'll grow out different uh, plants, mostly tomatoes for tribal members and give the little seedlings or cuttings off the plants to give the, to the tribal members. And they, they uh, let me put it, put all my germination trays, which I probably had around seven or so, um, put them in there. So the hoop house is nothing more than a greenhouse with the only way you get air or cool the temperature off is to raise up the sides, raise up the top or open the doors. And the hoop house, I had it was climate controlled, so it stayed one temperature. It worked perfect. Um, within two weeks, I had quite a few stuff coming back, wow. and uh, 
Some of them, none. I mean, absolutely and none come back. Nature, nature's cool. <laughs> you know, I guess some of the seeds that hadn't started germinating or whatever uh, came back then, and so so we went with what we had. Uh, I actually went up to Jane's uh, butterfly farm and got more seed and actually started cold stratifying more. And so I had 25, I don't, I don't remember how many uh, different types of seed I had the first time. But um, with the tribes, we helped each other. I gave them seeds that I had. They gave me seeds that they had. And the second time, I know it was around 27 different seeds or different types of seeds that I started. And so I had the, uh, uh, the first batch, which I don't remember how many trays or how many species I had that came back, but I had quite a few. I mean, I, I really had a lot more than what I thought. And so I'm growing them out, and then I'm cold stratifying the, the new ones. Uh, then, you know, I put those in germination trays and grew those out. Uh, so once, once germination is done, at a certain point when the... I think the second, uh, the second set of leaves is the true leaf, and so after that happens, you can repot them. So we got in supplies to repot the plants. Um, at one point, I had, um, I think I have sixty-one trays, and at, at one point I had those full. So sixty-one times thirty-two is almost two thousand. 2,000 plants and and that's before I kind of cleaned up so I, I probably had at one time 3,000 potted plants not to mention all the ones that were still in germination trays and I, I had a lot of help um, from volunteers and stuff repotting those plants I actually had a girl from Seminole State who's doing an internship at a food distribution come over and bring her girls and they helped me um, repot all that I all that I had left. So I probably had around three thousand potted plants, not to mention uh what I had left over or what had died in <laughs> um, but anyways uh after you germinate you repot and then at a certain age or a certain height uh Actually, it might be root development too. Uh, you go out and replant those, and our our goal was to replant them uh, in the places that we had the milkweed, and so that's that's pretty much where we're at now. I uh, uh, this this last summer we did it early, did our planting, the milkweed planting early, and uh, I hurt my back. So that's one reason why I haven't planted the potted plants. But, um, so that's where we're at now. We, um, uh, I've probably got, I don't know, I've, I've had actually a lot die um, for watering them too much, not watering them enough. You know, each, it, it's, you know, I, I had like 25 different species at one time and you know you put this species by this species and they like water and they don't and you kill off half of them before you realize <laughs> what's going through we actually uh, uh i was given uh, milkweed seed to plant out my own milkweed and you know they were my babies you know that's that's the main one of the main things and um i had germination wise i had a ton and just just from having so much stuff to do, I didn't have time to repot them. And so I had a, actually a lot die off. And when I finally potted them, I think I had six trays, which is around, I guess that'd be around 30 times. About 90, 90 milkweed plants, I guess. And they were one of the ones that did not like so much water. So by the time I figured that out, I had fewer, and then they actually all died. <laughs> so, so I didn't even raise any milkweed plants all the way, which was, you know, kind of the 
the main point, but but that's okay. <laughs> I guess. Well, again, yeah, it's a learning curve. Yeah. yeah. You know, the main ones, the ones I babied the most, died. So, um, right now I probably have, um, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. I probably have around 15 different species in there. Um, some of them are doing a lot better than the other ones. Uh, I have clammy weed that's doing really, really good. It's starting to flower. Um, I have um, Thin Mountain Mint, it's doing okay. I have uh, Sneeze Weed, that's doing pretty good. Um, I, I'm not really sure why it's not growing. Um, of course, then I'm not really sure how long it takes for um, plants to grow out in, in the hoop house, because it's crazy, you know, we don't get any rain here and all these uh, big plants that started Probably I started long before they did, and now they're huge, you know, outside with no rain, which is, you know, <laughs> weird <laughs> to me. But um, so I, I have quite a few that are doing good. I have some that, you know, I, like ironweed. I had three trays, now I'm down to two plants. It's one of the ones that doesn't like water. Um, so basically, that's where we're at. We're, uh, we did our planning event this year, which it, it took a lot longer than the one before. Uh, I hurt my back, so that's where we're at. We're trying to start planting those plants that I grew out. Well, how are you measuring success? I mean, well, a plant that the, lives, I know, yes. Yeah, there's a, there's a certain number, um, and I'm not sure which, what that is. That each, I think it was around maybe a, a th oh man, thousands a lot. There was a certain number that each tribe was supposed to plan out, and I'm not sure if that was by species or or in total. Um, but we are gonna do a fall germination um, planting deal. We're gonna put these seeds in cold stratification and and try to grow some more out in the fall to reach that number. Um, we've, I forgot to mention, but um, mainly the grant was for tribes. And so when Jane reached out to me, I was one of the, the many tribes that she tried to reach out to in the state. Um, as far as the five civilized tribes go, I think there's four. Um, I'm not really sure which one Choctaws, Chickasaws, us, uh, I'm not sure if Potawatomi is in the five tribes, I'm not really sure, but as far as the grant goes, um, there's six. Uh, the Osage, the Eastern Shawnee, uh, Potawatomis, us, Chickasaws, Choctaws, Creeks, oh, and it was the Cherokee in the five civilized tribes that they're not in it yet. Uh, we've talked to people, I actually know uh, some tribal members that are uh, Cherokees that own businesses that, you know, we've we've tried to talk to them, James tried to talk to them, and, and they're not interested at this time. Hopefully we can get all, you know, the five civilized. Um, where was I? Uh, Seminoles, uh, Chickasaws, Choctaws. Creeks, Osage, Eastern Shawnee, and um, oh man, there's one more, and I can't remember what it is. Cayuga. Uh, that's not all of it, but anyways, there's there's seven of us who are in it right now, and they each have the same, you know, the same goals. Some of them are in my predicament, which says they don't, you know, they just don't have a lot of resources. Um, now, the Chickasaws have actually been planting and growing out milkweed and giving it to their tribal members for at least two or three years now that I know of. So they're already ahead of the curve. They, you know, they have um, 
They have their greenhouses. They have. Are they a little bit bigger? Oh yeah, the, they're bigger. The Chickasaws are a lot bigger. Yeah, I was thinking they might be. Yeah, they. I mean, they have. They have greenhouses on greenhouses. They grow plants for, you know, for aesthetics for their buildings. They grow plants to give away. They have a. Um, a community garden in Davis at the their big museum cultural center down there mm -hmm. um, that tribal members can go and get plants and you know vegetables and all kinds of stuff I mean they grow out everything uh, the Chickasaws have been besides Jane the biggest help that I've had uh, the Potawatomis have helped me out a lot too um, the creeks um, I, th I think Jane's doing most of the work there. There's a, uh, they have a community in Morse that uh, has agreed to put the hoop house there and, and, and grow out the plants. I'm not sure. They have the hoop house set up, but I'm not sure as far as, you know, them. They just joined um, in the fall, so they weren't in on the first planting, but supposedly they sometime in in this month hopefully they've planted and all the other tribes have planted too so the grant covers each tribe to get a hoop house yep it covers the whole hoop house and it's actually the the hoop house is a different design where most hoop houses you raise up the sides or open the doors to get air and regulate the temperature this one uh, we had a guy from kingston um, design it and it has a, a pyramid kind of thing on top where all the hoop houses are designed with uh, cloth on the inside so if that we want to raise butterfly too we can and it has a deal at the top where they can't escape so it has a little pyramid thing at the top that actually opens up and kind of looks like you know butterfly wings which is kind of cool it's it's helped out a lot I'm not you know, like I said, I'm not used to greenhouses or, or anything to do with that. So I wasn't sure if it was a, you know, great design or what. But um, yes, all the tribes got a hoop house, and all the tribes were furnished, you know, um, a drill to put the plants in or an auger to put the plants in, different stuff like that, different chemicals to use to prepare the ground. Um, for the milkweed planting. Uh, a lot of mine, uh, especially the 29 acres, which we haven't actually got to planting on it yet, there's a lot of berry vines. I mean, gotta clear, from it, clear it first, huh? You gotta clear it first. <laughs> you know, brush hog, clear it, and um, you know, use Roundup. We, oh, we got a special kind of Roundup, I think, that doesn't uh, stay in the soil as long you know regular roundup is is what's hurting you know milkweed around I mean they use it to kill milkweed so <laughs> so uh, but it is it is you know what kills berry vines so that's that's what you gotta well, do well the berries would bloom does that's not something the butterflies like well yeah there are there are blooms on the butterflies and and we're not getting rid of a lot of it, but you know, to to get the ground prepared to, um, they told us from the beginning, they said, you know, when you're growing out wild plants, you know, even with these wild plants, I, I think I did really good. I mean, I had over 3,000 plants, more than that, you know, that I, that I didn't get, you know, planted. Uh, that either died, you know, in the germination trays or whatever. But as far as um, planting them in the ground, they are really hard to plant um, native plants, milkweed most especially. I don't, I don't know why. Uh, but um, we we've seen to do do good out here. But growing out native plants is really hard. I'm, I'm not sure why. You know, it's not like growing flowers in, in a garden. They're just... Throw the uh, seeds out there and hope for yeah, the best. More. <laughs> yeah, and you know, that's what my dad told me. He said, you know, why not just throw the seeds out there and water the seeds? 
But, you know, you would, I know, and you don't know, if you baby them more, and, you know, they're not, you know, you could have rain, you could not have rain, and then you have to go out into these, you know, places that aren't water accessible um, to water them, you know. Uh, so we raised them out, and and that was the whole goal is to plant them, plant them in the areas where where we had got the seed, where we know, you know, there's success with the plant already. So uh, that makes sense, and it's to kind of control too to know if you were making the difference. Mm -hmm. Too. Yeah. It's a three year, three year. It's a two year grant. Um, two year. They actually just finished to. Um, finish writing another one for another two years and so we'll know you know pretty quick if we got that but this is the end this will be the end of the two years this year and it's probably too soon to see if it's making a difference to in the number of butterflies yeah I, I would say so too soon. Um, what do you notice when they migrate I have noticed and even before that you know even before we planted the milkweed um, mowing uh, because uh, when I started the disc golf course you know you got to mow more um, of course I, I tried to integrate it with everything that we have going around here I, I've got it going around the pond and everything like that to, to keep it closer where we don't have to mow but while I was mowing um, even on the spots that I keep mowed down um, coming back in the fall I'm, I mean I'm I can spot a milkweed from a hundred yards away now <laughs> you know and so when you're mowing and you're real close you notice there's milkweed growing here that I didn't notice last year because I didn't know what it was and so you know I'd drive around it or you know something I'm like I'm planting it and it's already here and these are mature plants so you know they they told us it takes a couple of years for the milkweed plant to to get to that age where it actually flowers out and grows into the pods that produce the seeds. So um, when we came back to look at the the plants from this year, they're still not doing that. Maybe next year. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure on that. But yeah, I, I would see Mo and I would see these milkweed plants and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to grow these things out and here I am <laughs> driving over them, mowing them. Well, can you transplant the ones that you find out like that? You know, I've had a lot of people ask me that I don't know. and uh, Jane said that it, it's really hard because native plants have a really good root system which pulling that root system up you know hurts the plants and then you know putting it in a, a potted area or you know somewhere close to a house which is totally different ground than what they're used to. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you look at the crappy as a ground out here, and that is actually what the milkweed weed is growing in. I mean, um, the the eroded areas where, um, you know, you drill down with the drill, and it's this much sand, and then the rest is clay, that's where the milkweed are. And, you know, I, I figure that's why it's so hard for it to get established, because, you know, okay, when the green antelope horn, which is the milkweed that we're planting, um, grows into pods. I mean, those pods are full, and each plant will, depending on how many shoots it has, um, one stock will at least have three, two or three. And those, mil those milkweed pods are full of seeds, and when they bust open, you know, they spread out everywhere. And, and you'll see some of them that are close together, but, you know, so that means a lot of the seed is not getting good germination and it's not growing. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, from going around the area, you see, you see these horrible places where barely, you know, grass is not even growing in these places. That's where the milkweed's growing. And so that's, that's basically my thought for uh, using the OB for, for the areas for, to grow the milkweed because that's where they were already. You know, we have nine acres, uh, 29 acres, which is allocated to grow the milkweed, but I'm going out there and I see, you know, native grasses and uh, berry vines and um, locust trees, 
and no milkweed. So why not plant it in the places where I know it's growing <laughs> and it's and it's undisturbed? I mean, you know, every once in a while one of the guys will throw in there and maybe step on a plant, but we planted 2,500 plants. So and the ones from last year are doing great. So the ones from that we planted this year, um, we actually got them in the ground earlier. And so they should do better than the plants from last year. So, so the 1,200 acres that you just acquired, you'll include it on the... We've thought about adding it um, right now. Uh, on the financial side, there's not a lot that I can do uh, down there. Uh, my budget's pretty much 10000 Well, some are already growing in the area? Yeah, some are already growing. Mm-hmm. A lot more than you know the 29 acres that we already allocated for the project. Yeah, there there's actually a lot uh, growing down there. Uh, the the guy had cattle, and but the way the land is, he only run about 100 and something acres over that whole. See the self place is 800. He only had about 120 cattle over that whole 800 acres. A lot of it's wooded. A lot of it's hilly, rocky, and so you know he moved. He had to move his cattle around a lot to to feed them. And there is one hay. Uh, they call it the hay bottom. It's closer to Little River where there's better hay, you know. But uh, we've we've thought about it, and you know there's a lot a lot of places down there I could mm. I could allocate. The only problem is is that when you go to plant the stuff like I was saying before it's a lot easier here but you still have to have you know the tank on the back of the truck fill up the tank go back and forth because it's only a you know small tank uh, but yeah we've thought about it before we definitely thought well about you, it. you might come across different flowers uh, yeah there's, in, in there's a area. lot of um, since we bought it we the only thing that we've had done uh, we haven't ran agriculture on it but the only thing that we've done is put um, put in place that contract with NRCS, so we've done clearing, and uh, we've always had a, an agreement with BIA for prescribed burn. And uh, just last uh, March or April, we had a prescribed burn done on the place, and so the native grasses come in better, the milkweed comes in better because that's what they like too. Mm -hmm. Is you know when they all die off fire comes over and uh, I think a lot of the reason why the milkweed does better in um, the different soils is you know is just competition between other plants um, we we grew uh, and it's down there on Mekasuki at the softball fields but we grew in one spot that was pretty bare a lot of erosion and the milk we done better there and then we grew on the other side which is really thick with a lot of grass a lot of native flowers and it didn't come come in so good because of the vegetation and so you know fighting for that competition for sun and water and everything like that you know I mean even if you see a field that there's cattle grazing on there's not going to be a lot of milkweed. It's going to be here, there, and along the fence rows or something. Along the fence rows, uh, yeah. A lot of times, it's it's better there because it's undisturbed, and and our our place down there is undisturbed other than the fire, which it's already high high again. <laughs> well, I mean, timing that fire to benefit pollinators, mm -hmm. I guess, is a is another mm -hmm. piece of that puzzle. Yeah. What do you see? Well. I always like to ask too. In your in your memory, do you have a special one of butterflies, like from sixth grade when you learned the lessons, or you know, or anything like that? My little girl, uh, when I was telling her, you know, starting off this thing, she knew more than me. I mean, you know, she knew that they uh, go to Mexico for the winter and stay in the mountains there and come back. And so, yeah, you're right. It is at some age they. Mm -hmm. They do have that, um, I don't know if it's built into the curriculum of one grade or they just, you know, learn about monarchs, but, you know, I can't remember that. 
<laughs> like, I can't either, so don't feel bad. <laughs> you know, and, and um, you know, they come through twice a year. And as a kid, you know, you liked butterflies. But I really didn't know which one was which. I, I can't remember any one, one event with butterflies that, that I remember, especially with mom butterflies. So. Well, as part of this program, are you doing educational aspects for the... Yeah, we, um, we have had uh, different programs throughout the years with kids that will present the program to, you know. Usually Jane comes, she does a great job. Um, but in the past couple of years we've had, you know, budget cuts and so we haven't been able to even even do these camps. Now I'll do a, a disc golf camp. Uh, the guy that runs the recreation now, he does basketball and stuff like that. But we haven't really had uh, anything like that since our TYP program, they cut our TYP program. Because what we would do is we would do different events for them, like um, recreation stuff, and then we'd have the education too. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things I forgot to mention is when we did have TYP, um, something that I did on my own was um, I put out bluebird boxes. I'd seen, you know, there's always programs with bluebirds. And uh, I put out eight different bluebird boxes out at the mission. And I put it, you know, some at my house, some at my parents' house, my grandma's house. <laughs> and um, we, we had little educational things for, for the bluebirds. And we went out and checked the eggs. And, you know, then when they hatched, we went out and counted the number of babies with them. But we haven't had that because we don't really have a... Uh, per se a, a tribal youth anymore. That's what the TYP tribal, TYP, youth. tribal youth program. And you know, we would we would bring in different exercises with them, you know, sports and stuff like that, but we would also do stuff like that because they had a four week camp in the summer and then they had every day after school they had the program. And so we, we always did stuff like that. And and if we did we we would do that too, but um, we just don't have that now. So. Well, I should have asked. Are you are you a member of the? I'm not. Native? No, I'm not native. So. There's not uh, in your lineage somewhere. You don't know. Probably, probably like my great 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 granny beard. They called her. She was some. And I'm not sure what tribe, but it wasn't enough. You know, it wasn't enough for me. And then my wife is. Uh, notifiably native, but she, her family came from Texas, and they they weren't on the rolls. So, with what what tribe did she? Be? I, they're pretty sure Chickasaw, but they're not sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, positive, positive. So, yeah. So, well, so do you know if the butterfly itself is significant to the tribe for any particular reason, or you know, just. No. You know, tribal members are, are, um, you know, they work with nature just like anybody else. And, and in their past, they work with nature a lot before. And uh, they always, um, you should get the footage from uh, Jane for our uh, assistant chief. And I was going to ask assistant chief to come, but they've got inner travel this week. So if I'd have known that, maybe I would have said a different date. But... Um, he, he gave a, a, a excellent speech about natives and butterflies. And I mean, it just, just goes along with pollinators in general. I mean, without pollinators, without the honeybee, um, there is no food. You know, there's, there's um, God planned that all out when he, you know, designed the earth. I mean, it's, it all works together. And the native people knew how it worked together a lot more than we do now. You know, um, I grew up in that generation to where, uh, you know, my dad was a farmer and we raised peanuts. You know, they don't do that anymore for whatever, for whatever reason. You know, there's all these small towns 
uh, in Oklahoma uh, that you can go around and see these big plants and they're empty now and most of them are um, peanut plants where they would go. We went to the one in Calvin. There used to actually be one in Holdenville. Um, Durant actually has this huge monument of peanut where they were so big into peanuts down there that they, mm. you know, wanted to remember. And, um, you know, and so they did away with that. But I remember, uh, you know, I say I'm not good at growing stuff, but, um, you know, we raised peanuts. And so I was there on every, every spot. I remember sleeping in the back of a cab tractor in the middle of the night um, disking up ground being ready to, to plant peanuts because you know that's what my dad did and then when they grew we weeded weeded and then when they were ready to be uh, harvested we got the combine and you know we sucked them all up and spit them back into the truck and played in the back of the truck full of peanuts <laughs> I mean, you know, and kids these days, uh, they don't understand. They, they go to the grocery store and that's where you get your food, but people don't understand even though that, even though you grow food, has to be pollinated. And, um, you know, monarchs, butterflies, you know, all insects pollinate whether they're called pollinators or not. You know, they walk around flowers and get pollen stuck to them and, you know, go to the next plant and do the same thing. And, um, you know, pollinators are essential to, to what we do. I mean, That's just like them, just like them, without milkweed, uh, monarch caterpillars don't have anything to eat. You know, if we didn't have pollinators, we wouldn't have anything to eat. <laughs> it's keeping that ecosystem balanced, isn't it? You know, even if it's cattle, you know, cattle eat something. They eat wheat, which is pollinated, you know. I mean, every... Every plant out there is pollinated somehow, whether it pollinates itself or... Well, when you say you got rid of the weeds, were you actually doing hoeing ho ho by, ho by hand? Yep. By hand. By hand. So that's I mean, that phrase you hear, you know, what, don't have a row to hoe. Right. People want that. People that, don't that understand concept. that. Mm -hmm. You know, even kids my age don't understand that because most of the kids, you know, are are raised in the city. My little brother, you know, my sister, I don't think ever went out and did that. You know, I'm almost 40, and um, even people my age don't know that. But yeah, <laughs> I mean, there was no spray then that you could use. I mean, you had a hoe, and you had... I was younger then, so maybe I only had this side and this side, but, you know, we actually knew what a hole was and <laughs> what it was used for. And it wasn't, you know. But not, was it just for cotton? I mean, people here use that with the cotton concept. And, yeah, yeah, and, you know, my grandpa raised cotton in Sarah, but I, I wouldn't ever, I wasn't ever in on that. So I have no idea about that, just like everybody else. But, but peanuts, yeah. We hold weeds and um well when you harvested peanuts did you all keep any in use for yourself? No, no we really didn't. Wouldn't um, roast roast them and have them for snacks? You know, I, I don't know why. You know, I don't know why we didn't. Of course by then we'd ate so many raw ones that made ourselves sick. Oh, that's <laughs> true, I guess. Um you know, I don't ever remember us doing that. I was from Seven to twelve probably is about the time that I remember, you know, and and we'd get out there before the sun came up, and 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 then I'd help my dad, um, you know, know how to irrigate. <laughs> we moved the irrigation pipe and you know hand pipe and the you know gas powered pipe. I mean, in the middle of the night, I remember one time that that it was lightning so bad that uh, I almost cried in the truck because the lightning was so close and striking here and striking there and my dad's out there moving <laughs> metal pipe <laughs> with water running through it. <laughs> but anyways, that's...
farmers sacrificed a lot. Yeah. Yeah. My dad's paying for it now. Arthritis and feet are, his heels almost wore off, but that's, that's how you did it back then. <laughs> I mean. Yeah. And then with the insectic pesticides and all that come along, it's not helped. No. It's, you know, it's helped and it's hurt, so I guess it's, it keeping yeah, that helped balance. Yeah, it's helped and it's hurt. Keeping that um, balance. When I was going to school, on top of working at the funeral home, I worked for another guy who, uh, he raised a few peanuts, but by then it was, you know, my dad did it for a living. So he raised cattle and peanuts, and so once peanuts was done, I mean, what do you do but turn your peanut fields into pasture and raise more cattle? You know, but uh, there for a little while I worked for a guy who still had peanuts, and uh, he would go out there and, you know, pull weeds with his hand, but then, you know, hire somebody with a plane to to get the rest of the weeds. So, so how many acres would it take to keep a family going to do peanuts? I mean, how many acres oh should your dad do? He wasn't doing it full time if you well, We had, let's see, seems like we had around four to 500 acres. Oh, a lot. Yeah. On, well, on one, one place. And um, how many places did we raise peanuts on? We had three farms. One was in Holdenville, and we had two in Atwood. And we raised the majority of the ones uh, on the Moore Place and then the Seaman Place in Atwood. And we probably had, I would say, 80 acres at the Seaman Place. maybe 120 acres at the other place. Mm -hmm. So, you know, around around 200. But then, you know, and that's the crazy thing too, is um, communities back then, the farming communities were big and everybody helped everybody. I mean, when it was, you know, I didn't just hoe our pasture. You know, there was a couple of families down there that raised peanuts and we, Joined in. Joined in with everybody. So, so I, you know, I'm not sure if that's all we had or if we planted on other people's places or not. Kind of similar to the threshing crews that they had early on with the wheat. Right. right. Where everybody pitched in and moved to the next farm. They right. Moved to the next. Yeah. It, 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 was, it was like that. I mean, everybody helped everybody. I mean, when you're out there combining uh, peanuts, there was at least... You know, three of them out there, and so when you got done with yours, then you went on with somebody else's. So, I mean, that may have been the start of your interest in in wildlife and such right. too. Right. Right. Yeah. Favorite time of the year is summer. Summer. Yeah, I always like summer because I mean, then we went on. When I was younger, we went to the farm. Of course, you're out of school. <laughs> yeah. I like spring too. Now that I'm getting older. That cool weather is a lot better than it is now. <laughs> but I always liked the heat, never did like the cold. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Well, it's 100 degree they can keep. Uh, yeah. I don't know if butterflies do well and when it gets this warm or not, probably not so much. Well, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know that it, it might not matter too much. I'll need to learn a little bit more. Yeah, I do too. And I, you know, I was thinking, man, I need to go back and learn what I learned because well, I forgot. She's gonna ask me questions. I'm gonna say, oh, I don't know. <laughs> and at least the mom likes the right colors, so orange and black. Right, orange, orange and black. black. Or good old OSU. Right. Well, we've covered a lot. Anything else you can think of that we need to add? Um, I can't really think of anything. So I mean, go, going forward, they're doing this. They're doing a second grant. Right. Going forward, and, and so it'll and be you'll basically still, and the you'll, same thing. Yeah, and you'll still be even if it doesn't come through, you'll still be maintaining your part that you've already planted by the right disc off, and you'll right. eventually do the twenty nine acres. Right. At some point. Um, you know, at some point we thought about you know growing our own. We, we actually uh, we had bought some land. Um, 
closer to Seminole. I don't know if you've seen Jasmine Moran or uh, the Kids Museum. Mm -hmm. We actually bought some some land back behind there, and we had entertained the idea of. Um, I had went to Branson a couple of years ago and seen Butterfly Palace. I don't know if you've went to Branson or not, uh, but they pretty much have this museum that it's it's all butterflies. You go in there, you watch a video, you learn about butterflies, you you know have all. I mean, there's a gift shop with butterfly everything. Um, but anyways, you learn about butterflies, and I'm not sure if it was the monarch but butterfly that we watched the mm -hmm. film over, but um, you know you learn about butterflies, and then you go into their um, spot where they have all these flowering plants and that's where they keep their butterflies and uh, so you can go in there and stay as long as you want to and watch all these different butterflies fly around cool. and we actually thought um, about doing that maybe at some point um, you know uh, along with that you know going to schools and um, one of the biggest things, one of the biggest reasons Abby remembered the butterfly thing is because at the end they got a cocoon and they watched the cocoon every day till it, you know, came out, became a caterpillar and, I mean, not a caterpillar, but uh, became a butterfly. And, um, and then they got to go outside and release it. I mean, that was the coolest thing that, you know, and so everything that they talked about, they're sitting there going, oh, we're going to get one of these, we're going to get one of these, and we get to watch it come out. And so we thought about doing that too, or even supplying the schools with the butterflies to do. So so, um, so we've got a plan. I'm not sure uh, when that'll happen or if it'll happen, but if we do it, it will be close to that museum where people can go to that museum or come to us or come and do both at the same time. Um, so, you know, that's one thing, that's one thing that we've got in the works. Um, but yeah, hopefully we'll get the grant to do it again. And, um, and you won't let someone else take a weekend of watering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I would love... I would love some more help yeah. with the project. Jane, you know, she goes around and helps everybody. and I feel like she helps me find some a lot more than others. But, uh, you know, it's part of the tribe that we need to, you know, it's a, it's a give and take for the, you know, grant. So we need to, I feel we need to be doing more than what we're doing. Um, you know, I can't do it all. And... Uh, Mm -hmm. And it's hard <laughs> doing it by myself. But no, I just say that um, you know anything you do, whether whatever school you go with, OSU is agricultural based, which is what we all should be. You know, I mean, we all should learn where these things come from, where our food comes from. We should learn about nature. Um, and not just jump on the bandwagon of, you know, let's have electric cars for, for that reason. But why, why we do what we do, and it's because we preserve this this planet because it takes care of us too. And um, you know, if if we're not um, taking care of the planet, you know, I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, uh, but but we all just need to do our part basically I mean you know if if you can do something uh, more economic do it if, if you don't have to spray you know round up or whatever you know don't spray it if you're like like these uh, roads and counties and states that you know can't even pay for crews to to mow you know all the way to the fence on on these roadways then don't because you know it helps out the pollinators because wildflowers are going to grow in these areas that's where they've grown forever um, 
I mean, I like my disc golf course to be mowed, but not every place has to look like a golf course. Um, and just, you know, give back, you know, I guess. That's it. Okay. <laughs> I think that's a good way to stop. So thank you for talking with me today. It's been fun. Okay. Thank you.